Okay, SF. Uh, we have a, a status report in the R journal. R journal is is uh, full open access and no publication charges, no uh, no charges to read. Uh, the same as the journal of statistical software, and that's the way it's going to stay. Uh, there are also both in principle fully reproducible so that for journal of statistical software you your work or the results which you're presenting have to be reproducible in the code you provide in the r journal we prefer submissions of that kind but there may be other submissions for which this is not uh, practical so we don't require it's an absolute uh, absolute definition uh, the status uh, when SF stabilized and, and was released onto, onto CRAN was that uh, geometry, geometries were recorded as a list column, which then contained R wrappers around objects which adhered to the, the simple feature specification. This meant that the uh, feature geometries were stored in numeric vectors in the case of single point coordinates as a coordinate pair. 1x, 1y, but also possibly a z, which would be in a vertical dimension, and there might also be an m, because the simple features support uh, coordinates with four uh, double precision uh, values. As obviously x and y would be in double precision, z would be in double precision, but m it has been used by some people for storing the date at which the coordinate was observed, which is obviously not easily represented in a, a double precision number, or some other um, value observed at that place. But it's, it's not obvious that the M was thought through when, when this was done. The M is almost certainly an expression of relative measurement error, M measurement error, so that the idea would be that if you look at your uh, uh, GPS, the harvest of GPS coordinates, you'll see that they're associated very often with an X and a Y and a Z and a measurement error, that they'll tell you plus or minus where you are. Uh, so that the M could have been, that the, the idea might have been that it was intended to be a place where you would put the uncertainty concerned, the, uh, the uncertainty surrounding the position. Now, the uncertainty surrounding the position probably also should have been a, a, a vector of length 3 because you could have different uncertainty in X and Y and certainly different uncertainty between X and Y and Z. So that, but M is a compromise, so that maybe, that, uh, maybe M could be used as the, the worst measurement error you would see because the measurement error in Z is probably going to be dimensionally less than the measurement error in X and Y in absolute terms. So we have, we have this, this two or three or four values, so that it can be a vector of two, vector of three, vector of four, and, and we then get to a, a matrix of, uh, uh, of, of, of data. So we've already got numeric vectors, matrices, which are collections of coordinates, or lists of matrices, which are lists of collections of coordinates. And it's also possible to undertake arithmetic operations on them in the standard. The features are held in an XY class if they're two-dimensional, or alternatively in XYZ or XYM if they're three-dimensional, or XYZM if they're four-dimensional. And if you've got an XYM and you think it's an XYZ, then you're in trouble so that the classes have different names. So, but M is very rarely found and Z is relatively rarely found. So here we just create a point from, from a numeric vector of length two with points one and three, and then we can do, uh, we can do um, uh, arithmetic operations on these. So here we're in incrementing them uh, each by, 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 by one. So that they're, they're shifting northeast, so that they're shifting northeastwards uh, for, for, for each step. So that if we look at the final one, the P PT3, it's an XY, uh, an object of class XY, it's a numeric vector of length 2 with values 3 and 5. Because we've incremented PT1 plus 1 is 
PT2. PT2 plus 1 is PT3, so we've, we've moved sort of up the diagonal. We can render this as well-known text, which is also a standard. Uh, WKT is used in a number of different contexts. This is the context for representing uh, simple feature geometries. And in this case, it would be represented by the keyword point. And then in brackets with a space but no comma are the coordinates. If you insert a comma, then you would need to have, call it a multipoint, and then you would have the next two uh, numbers, which would be the would be the the an, a multipoint object, or you can express it as well-known binary, uh, which would be what you would or the way in which simple features objects are stored in databases like uh, uh, SQL Server, Oracle, and so on and so on and so on. They st they store blobs, uh, binary large objects, uh, and the well-known binary is then represented as a string of bytes. So it's just a, stri a raw string of bytes, and this, this would be the representation of the point. Uh, in this case, we'd see that this, this is the three, but we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And here we've got uh, the, 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 the first ones are the definition of what kind of, a, what kind of a, an object it is, and so on, so that they would be in the first five bytes and then we've got and then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there are two double precision numbers there. And these are the binary representations. And this is this is why SF is bound to be much um, more nimble than SP because it uses the representation which is also used when you read the data in. So the data are brought in and not converted into some other class structure. But in the SF object, the simple feature representation is represented directly. So that when you're moving in and out, then you get in, the data loads faster because it's not being converted into other forms. You can write it out faster and you can operate on it faster because the operations in the GEOS library work on simple features so that SF can integrate all that we were doing in our Google and our GEOS and make it work more securely because we're not dealing with potentially badly programmed interfaces where we have to change from one representation, one internal representation to a different internal representation and then to another internal representation which the user doesn't see but all of which takes time and is in programming terms fragile. That is, it would have been fairly easy for Colin or me to get something wrong in writing RGOS. It would be easy for Barry or me to get something wrong in writing the vector components of our Google. And putting it right again at this stage is harder, so that when, when the uh, external software evolves and changes, we need to do much more work to keep uh, the SP, our Google, our GEOS uh, collection of packages running smoothly than would be the case with, with, with uh, SF, because SF is interfacing them. So it's closer to the metal, if you like. So it, it's, 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 the access to the representation is, is much more direct. Those are the objects. Here we had three of them, point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, and we can say this is a list, and we can convert it into a, uh, a list column, an SFC. These are SFGs, simple feature geometries, and then we make a list of the simple fe feature ge geographies to make them into a simple feature com column, an SFC object, which is what, we've, what we're doing here. So we say that this is now an SFC point that is a, an SF column where all of the geometries are points. In SP, we could not, by definition, have geometries which varied in type across an object. So you had a, an S, a spatial object, but then all of the geometries had to be of the same, same variety, so that they had to be lines, or they had to be polygons, or they had to be 
points, and you couldn't have a mixture of points and lines. And in our geos, we have a lot of very contuse code, really hard to maintain, trying to back out of situations where, say, you, you've intersected two objects. Uh, you've intersected two objects. Uh, have I turned this off? Uh, I need to use the pen. Not pan pen. No, it's not. Uh, this one, yeah. Uh, this one? Yeah. Then, 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 so I won't, I won't draw you it, but if you can imagine, as so I'll, I'll draw, draw in the air, uh, you, you've got an object which intersects with another polygon. So here we've got just a, a straight line. So we're crossing over, and then we would have a polygon intersecting. Then the boundary runs exactly along the boundary of the second object. So you've got a line intersection, and then it goes out again and comes back and touches at one point. So you've got an, an intersection between two objects, which is composed of a polygon, a line and a point, which is a valid intersection. It's just that in SP, we didn't have any way of handling that. But in SF, you can have a column which contains a geometry collection. This is also messy because it means you need to use different steps if you want to visualize the, the different classes of objects. But in SP, we had this idea that the world was divided into things which were either grids or pixels or polygons, or lines, or points. But in fact, geometries can combine these, these, these representational forms. So a, a, a space, a, 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 an SF uh, column can be a geometry collection. So it's a collection of geometries of, of different types. In this case, it's, it's, it's just points, but that's, that's okay. So that's okay. And then the uh, structure of it expresses what the first list element is. Once you've got the column, which typically you get by reading in data from a, from a spatial data file of some kind, uh, would be to add this to a data frame. Here we've got three observations. Before we had a data frame with, uh, with, a, um, with five columns. And here we can see where, where we are. Uh, the representation for E has gone a little bit uh, haywire because this was a character and it's, it's a factor and it's now being represented by its numerical value. Uh, and I haven't backtracked to find out why that happened. So that the way that you attach your simple feature column to a, an existing data frame is to say the, the ST geometry of the data frame is, is this column. And you then, if you look at the, 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 uh, the object, the, the print method for SF objects is more user-friendly than the print object for SP objects. It says that it's a simple feature collection with three features and five fields. The geometry is of type point. The dimension is of type x, y. It has a bounding box between uh, 1, 3, 3, and 3, and 5. So 1, and 3, and 3, and 5. Uh, we don't know what the coordinate reference systems are. And this is the head, or the first couple of lines of, of, of the... Of the um, of the data itself. So we see that we've got the column here, A, B, C, D, E, more or less as they were before the break. And then we've got an extra column called geometry, which is where the simple feature geometries live. And the representation here, which is printed, is, is the, is the well-known text representation for, the, for, those, for those geometries. Uh, the, there are in total uh, in a, a little over 70 different classes of simple feature geometries, and the SF package does not implement all of these. 
some of them you meet uh, occasionally. Those of us who work in Norway meet them more often than we appreciate. Uh, because Statkart, for reasons which escaped me totally, has decided that it wants to use um, uh, curves or multi-curves for some boundaries which don't need to be curves because they could be straight lines. Very often they are straight lines, but they define them on the production of files which they make available to the public, like JSON, the GeoJSON files of uh, municipality boundaries, they will quite often make them available, including multi-curves. Uh, you don't want to know about multi-curves, especially if they're a straight line. As if they're a straight line, they might just as well be be a straight line. But but anyway, data providers say you can have free data provided you, you, nobody will be able to use this data once we've provided it. And Statcart is is really nobody here works for Statcart. <laughs> okay, if you do, this is your send, <laughs> the the your your path to heaven is to is to is to make sure that people that you, you that the people in your administration provide data which actually works for users rather than data which is standards compliant but uses parts of the standards which nobody else visits or well, nobody that i know anyway uh, we have ways around that there's a a, a um, function in sf called uh, google utils which allows you to use the utilities from uh, the google distribution uh, and you would then say the utility you want to use is ogr to ogr which provides for a method of convert to linear, so that if it comes across a curve with an extra argument, if you wish, to say how many segments to... So if, if a line is de defined as a curve, then you can make it into a, a, a line string of straight lines with, with, say, each one bending at one or one and a half degrees, and, and you're done. So you can convert it into something which is, is linear, when, when it becomes stupid is when the line you're putting in, which was defined as a curve, is actually straight initially, which is very often the case because it's very difficult to survey curves. And they're not actually recorded as curves. It's just the way that they've set up the... Uh, this is the rant off. I didn't put the rant on uh, marker first, but this is rant off. This is very frustrating, especially if you're dealing with work, say, with master's students who haven't seen much spatial data, and they say, wouldn't it be nice to have boundaries of Norwegian municipalities? And suddenly you find out, yes, we can download them for free. Yes, the file is extremely large and doesn't need to be. And then you find out that it includes curves which turn out to be straight lines. Um, so the, the, there, are, there are so many extra things you need to do in order to get to data which is which is usable. There are quite a lot of other data providers who, uh, who do the same kind of thing. So that you can have it for free, but actually it's impossible to use for anybody who is not a professional uh, data cartographer. Uh, a small secret, many of the functions in the SF package begin with ST underscore. And you'd think, well, okay, it's the SF package that they should begin with SF underscore. Some begin with SF underscore. Others begin with ST underscore. Why do they do this? This is because uh, in PostGIS, which is a, a spatial uh, add-in, a separate program actually, but it sits on top of the Post PostgreSQL database. And there they also use ST for the functions which they use in SQL for doing things like spatial lookup. And in PostGIS, when they thought of this, they said, well, what we want to do is represent data in space and time, so that they said space and time ST underscore, but PostGIS didn't get to time either. So it's a little bit like the Google, with the Google that we had here, so that there's... It's, an, it's um, uh, an aspiration. We like to do space-time sometime, so we'll call over the function space-time, even though they only really do space. So, and it's, it's much the same in SF. So that we, we thought that it was amusing that other people had the same problem with aspirations which weren't 
yet fulfilled. Um, at some stage, we'll find a, another generation, probably the generation 15 years younger than, than Jakub Novosad, Robin Lovelace, and Tim Applehans. And that generation will implement space-time properly. But and you're very welcome to, to join in. But so, so far, nobody's really managed to get it, get it to, to, to hang together. We're getting closer. We, we are getting closer. We're getting, we're getting closer. Uh, the SF also integrates the, the, uh, the predicates from GEOS. We talk about uh, topological predicates when we're asking, do geometries touch? Do geometries overlap? Does a point, or which points of a point geometry uh, lie inside polygons from a polygon geometry, so points in polygons. So when we're asking questions of the geometries themselves, and operations would be when we want to answer not just yes, no, or in most of the cases, the, uh, the predicates return sparse representations rather than dense representations, instead of looking at a matrix of which polygons overlap with, say, which roads go through which local authorities. So you could take it out as a matrix and be, be uh, true-false. So that you'd say uh, road number A goes through municipalities 3, 5, and 7, but doesn't go through all of the other 20 municipalities. So that would be the dense representation. The sparse representation would be road A goes through the indices of which polygons it does go through. So you just store the the numbers of the polygons that it goes through, and that would be the sparse representation as a list. Uh, and that, uh, that's also re re returned by the uh, binary predicates. Uh, the unary predicates would be a question like, is this geometry valid? Which is an interesting question, and surprisingly often the data provided by public data providers is not valid. Uh, that's the geometries that they provide are not valid, including StatCut, of course. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Never mind. But it, it, for downstream users, it would be really convenient if the upstream data providers did try to check that the data were simple features valid before they published them as simple features geometries. But they don't seem to. Uh, GEOS topological operations include all of the standard ones like union, so joining geometries together, uh, intersections, uh, and so on, but also distances and buffering. Buffering is that you uh, extend the boundaries of a particular object. In this case, we have points, but what, what are we doing here? This, this is an SF object, but it's a data frame. It's a data frame with two list columns, one of which is called geometry. And it's that geometry column which is the one to which the buffer is going to be applied. So it then says, OK, you've asked me to do a buffer by 0, 3. Off we go. What have I got? I've got points. OK, I can do that. That means just draw a line around. Now, here you start running into problems with the coordinate reference system. Because here we haven't defined the coordinate reference system, so we're assuming it's planar. So that zero, three objects will lead to a circle. So you're just drawing a line around with a, with a radius of zero, three. And that's okay. But if we knew that the coordinates were geographical and not planar, uh, then you'll get a warning. We hope you know what you're doing. You shouldn't be doing this. In some cases, we try and make accommodations so that when you ask the length of something, which is where the, the, the geometries are expressed in geographical coordinates, then we'll try and make an effort to give you a length which makes sense. So it won't be the Euclidean distance in, 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 um, in decimal degrees but it would try to be the great circle distance for some understanding of what you think the shape of the, of the Earth is. But that's stretching the envelope a little. It, 
most of the, or the, the topological predicates and operations should really only be conducted on planar geometries where you know that you can use Euclidean distances and you, you're not forced to use uh, spherical or elliptical uh, adjustments. Now, you could argue, and the people in Spatstat said, well, Australia, especially northern Australia, is much closer to the equator so that the, the difference is not so big. If, if, say, you're on Lake Victoria, then, then you're really close to the equator, so that a degree east-west, in terms of kilometers, is, is, is exactly the same as a degree north-south. So that, at that if, if you're really close to the equator, then the difference between geographical and planar coordinates is, is, not, is not very great. In Bergen, it, it's completely different. So that, so that a degree north-south here is, is what it would have been elsewhere, about 100 kilometers. A degree east-west is, is, it's not that. And, and so, so that the, if you get to Spitsberg, has anybody worked on Spitsbergen? Then you get these, the, you, get, you think, okay, so we've got satellite data and we've downloaded it in geographical coordinates. And then you try and make maps, and you get these these very very funny thin wedges, uh, it, it, so that so that uh, SF tries to be in your face. It will issue warnings uh, if if you're using geographical coordinates when you're trying to do uh, topological predicates and operations and. There's a further point in addition which I'll mention but which isn't in the, in, in the script refers to the way in which the operations are conducted. Um, one of the problems that we had initially when we were trying to interface the GEOS library was that we did, or I didn't understand the, um, the way in which they expressed scale or precision. Uh, because when you're doing an intersection between, as here we're dealing with, with coordinates expressed in, in, uh, in uh, double precision floating point numbers, about how much precision do you get there? Say you, you've, you've, you've done some multiplications, about how much precision do you get in, in, a, in an eight, eight byte uh, floating point number? The best you get is about 15 or 16 uh, digits after the decimal point. Mm, about 15, 16. But if each time you multiply, then you're losing about four. So you, you, maybe you've got eight. Uh, now, one of, the, one of the routes that GEOS can take is to say that we treat all coordinates as integers, but we have to scale them up. So multiply them by a big number, like uh, 100, 100 million. So you, you can scale them up, and you then say that a point is identical if it falls within the same square that you would get if you removed the, when you're converting from floating point to integer, so that you're then say you're discretizing the geometries to integer, and when once they come out the other side, then they go back again. In RGOS, we use uh, a scaling factor of of uh, e to the eighth. So we scale them up to integer, and if they're similar or not, then the ones which are in the same box, which would be the same integer number, end up being in the same place. The ones which are in a different box are not in the same place, so that they don't touch or they don't interact. Or, but SF uses another understanding of precision, which is to say that use the native precision of, dual, uh, of, of uh, double precision numbers, where what you've got after the, uh, in the very best case, the 15th position after the decimal point is fuzz, it's random. 
And this, lead, this leads to trouble with uh, representations such as GeoJSON, which are quite common, as they're represented in text. Some of them are represented with 20 digits. So you've got a, a, a geographical coordinate represented with 20 digits. Uh, the 20th digit is invisible even with a strong microscope. So that it's so small, you can't see it. But that quite often the, the rendering as a, so you've got two objects which appear to have similar numbers in the GeoJSON file, but end up not touching because of numerical issues. It's not necessarily that the data provider is doing it wrong, but there's something there is leading to being different fuzz. Uh, it is possible. I, I haven't gone gray because of that. There are other reasons for that, but if you're looking looking at an early grey hair, then, then some of these numerical issues are serious contenders. Because you can't see why these two municipalities, which should be neighbours of each other, aren't neighbours. And they aren't neighbours for purely numerical reasons, just in the representation. And SP, does it, SP and RGS do it slightly differently from SF, so that if you wanted to do a topological operation and it's not working, then coS to SP, do it through our geos and see if you get the same problem. Very often the problems will be down to something else, which is that the lines coming from the geojson actually, uh, the, 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 there could be a sliver, that's a small area of background, which isn't a member of anything, or you could have lines which overlap slightly and those are, those are other things. So there, there are other things which sort of bubble up occasionally that uh, your, your geometry is invalid. And on Tuesday afternoon, we get to the TMAP package, and TMAP package from the last release uh, started using ST is valid in all cases. that You have to use it. Because GEOS uh, tightened up one of its um, heuristics for handling geometries. These are things I'm mentioning because uh, in a year you'll hit something, you say, I don't understand this. And then you say, I, it's that. It, it's something to do with the precision of the data. It's something, something there. Uh, there are tricks. One of them is buffering by zero. And in many cases, buffering a geometry by zero would clear up the, the misrepresentation on the way in. But it doesn't always work. Sometimes, sometimes there are real bugs in, in the input data. But sometimes just buffering by zero means that GEOS has to uh, deconstruct the geometries and then reconstruct them again. And in reconstructing them, it, tr it tries to do it properly in, in, in accord with the standards. But there are, there are a whole range of, of oddities which take far too much time in this. So it's a, doing science is quite a lot of it is actually doing clearing up messes which shouldn't have been there. And, and some, are, some of them are to do with the precision of floating point numbers and some of them are to do with the representational issues uh, under the hood. So here, once we've, once we've uh, done our buffer, then we can see that we've changed from point representation on the output to polygon representation. We've now got circles drawn around, or we've got, uh, we've got polygon rings drawn around each of the points where the, we, we can control the number of segments that we're using for each, uh, each 90 degree uh, arc. So we can make it a smoother circle for graphic visualization by increasing the number of segments, or we can say, it doesn't matter too much. Um, and, and uh, go for fewer segments. The more segments you use, the longer it takes to run and the larger the output object is. Almost all of the predicates and other uh, uh, operations, topological predicates, topological operations, which one might uh, ever need are present, including the standard, all of the standard ones. Uh, and uh, Edsa's article includes a, a description of the of the uh, standards which are used for these for these um, for these predicates. However, or as Stan Openshaw, uh, a geographer from the last century, who's still alive but he's not very well, um, he always said, "But 
he had, uh, this was in the time when there were overhead projectors, and he always, at conferences, produced a big butt, uh, which was just on one slide. It was just butt with a, an exclamation mark. Uh, this is the butt. We had thought in 2017, 2016, that was implementing SF. We moved on quickly to the next one, which was space-time uh, space arrays, stars, space-time arrays which was, the, was, was thought of as being the raster representation. So we just, we've learned a lot doing SF. So we go straight into stars and we have another year's contract with the R consortium who paid for a couple of, of trips by EDSA to conferences. And, and I went down to Munster as well. And, and things got a lot stickier. But they didn't get stickier or difficult because we were lazy, perhaps we worked too hard. We made a good deal of progress. And there was a, a lot of discussion about how to handle these space-time arrays and the idea of handling regular arrays, which would be like uh, Earth observation imagery, where you have uh, X and Y, and you have... Uh, uh, I, can, I think I can see why, why the, this one has stopped working because there's an, an interaction required on... Cancel. Maybe, maybe it's come back now. No, I can just move this. This was on pan. The problem was a hidden interaction on a, a third uh, iPad. The raster package had taken a lot of the weight off SP for the representation of raster data. But SP could manage X and Y and attributes, but it couldn't manage time. The space-time package could manage X and Y and attributes and time. But what that did was to define the geometries as one component, define the, uh, the time slices, which could be regular, sparse, that means that they're regular but with some of them missing, or irregular. EDSA also became involved in work with trajectory data, which would be like the movements of animals tracked by with a, with, with a tracker. Uh, where there's, uh, uh, where there's an, uh, the, the observations are points moving through space and time. And then you can associate those with background variables, uh, also observed at the same uh, space and time. So the idea was to have uh, a framework which allowed both for regular, that's grids, arrays, and irregular uh, spatial objects, which could be polygons that were tracking the performance of some variable observed at regular or irregular intervals uh, through time. This would be quite like the transport data. It's, it's more complicated data structures because they're in space and time, and then they're not necessarily repeating. Uh, Earth observation satellites are usually tracking in more or less the same tracks so that they'll be revisiting the same, the same point uh, uh, on a regular basis. There are other nice little little details like clouds, which come into Earth observation data. And because sometimes there are clouds there and sometimes there aren't clouds. And, and so you, sometimes you've got data, sometimes you haven't got data. But the idea was to use this, this conceptualization of an array, which has a, a geometry which may be conceptualized in two dimensions, but it could also be as that would be a raster, but we could also say that it's an abstract geometry which could be uh, a met station or a set of met stations which are points. They have a point, a point representation. Or polygons or lines or 
so that we don't we don't necessarily have to view stars simply as a being or way of doing rasters, but that that was the that was the the the, the entrance point and has then 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 been 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 generalized. In addition, there was the raster package, which is a, an, a widely used package, very successful at doing what it does, but started to have was starting to have. Uh, breathing problems when it was trying to deal both with multiple attributes and with time, so that the idea of stars was to was to look at uh, arrays which could collapse to a raster layer but didn't have to. So you choose one variable at one point in time or for one time interval. So the, the standard example in, in the package is to use a data set which we'd used in the in the second edition of the book, which is from Alinda in, in on the Brazilian Atlantic coast. Um, and was from uh, Landsat uh, 7 uh, enhanced thematic mapper. So that there were a number of bands, so that the blue, green, red, uh, near infrared and so on. So that there were a number of different bands. And the, the data file is provided in the stars package, and we just say, then say read underscore stars of the name of the file. That then goes out to Google, identifies which driver it needs to use, reads this is a GeoTIFF file. So that's okay. And this, this would then look very similar to what was happening with read Google in the SP uh, world. It's possible to operate on the bands in slightly different ways than, than took place uh, in the SP world, where in the SP world, the, uh, the data was stored as columns in a data frame, whereas here, they're in an array. So that here we have an array which goes in the X direction from 1 to 3, 4, 9, the Y direction 1 to 3, 5, 2, these are the numbers of rows, number, uh, in the numbers, numbers of columns, numbers of rows, and this is the number of bands, so the band 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, these have a coordinate reference system attached to them. And it's possible to do things to, to the bands more or less in the same kind of, kind of way uh, that uh, had been done, uh, had been done uh, previously for uh, uh, spatial grid and spatial pixels uh, data frames in SP. The way that this is being done here is using uh, ST apply, which is would be like in in standard R you use apply to do something to dimensions of an array. The object L7 here is being treated as an array. So that what we're saying here is that we want to move across the x and y dimensions. So we want to look at each of the each of the, the pixels, the cells in the raster, and on those cells we want to uh, take the difference between the fourth band and the third band and divide that difference by the sum of the fourth band and the third band. This is the normalized ve difference vegetation index. So this is the difference and this is the way we're normalizing the vegetation index using the near infrared and the red bands. And this is a standard index in, in Earth observation. So that here you define a, a small function and then apply it across those uh, dimensions of the array to which you want to use it. If we had had multiple time series here, we could also apply it across time. So it would do the same thing on the time dimension as well. So if we had had time, then we'd be saying for each of the bands, so for, for, for each of the combinations of third and fourth band, then do this to it and give us the time series of uh, uh, NDVI uh, values. The output from this is then a stars object with two dimensions and one attribute, and it's only got an X and Y because we've only collected here. There's only a single band, so that we don't need to we don't need to know uh, any more. And these are these are the values of the of the NDVI across that. So the representation was considered, we were considering, considering this as an array. A downside of handling arrays is that arrays expect all of the values in the array to be of the same kind. In this case, they're all uh, double precision floating point numbers. The input band, or the input bands coming from satellite would have been measured between zero and 255. So this is a single byte. So the four, the band three, one, two, three, four, uh, and five are single bytes when they come from the instruments. 
they've been calibrated and all of that and all of that, and then we're using uh, data which has been, been post-processed uh, after coming down from the satellites. We're not using raw satellite data, but it's, it's in, in single byte uh, bands, uh, uns unsigned, uh, unsigned bytes. But then things in the development of stars started getting uh, difficult. Well, not difficult, they started getting... There's this difference between what is an opportunity and what's a challenge. And the opportunity was to delay completion of the package to go further, in fact, much further than Rasta had done. What Rasta did to accommodate large data was to say, OK, so we'll divide it up into bits and read in a chunk at a time. So read in a, so you, so you divide it up into... Uh, uh, the rest of file is simply too large. We need to look at 100, so 10 this way, 10 this way. So we divide it up into smaller bits, read in the first uh, chunk from the first chunk row, that's, and then do that across the top row, then the next row, then for the 10 rows that you're dealing with. Each of these may be quite large rasters, so they could be thousands of... Uh, or tens of thousands of pixels in each of the chunks. But doing it that way gets you through, so you're, you're through. But you're still dealing with, uh, with um, a considerable amount of movement of data. Now, what started happening during the uh, implementation of STARS was that uh, a lot of time was spent experimenting with the proxy equals true so the first version of proxy equals true looked like what raster did. So that raster was not keeping the raster in memory, it was keeping it on disk and was accessing it in chunks. So it was the first version. But the next version and successive versions, which are not even in stars, end up doing really quite different things, which means that a good deal of the computation is actually done on the data provider backend. So what you're doing is writing small scripts which are going to be committed to the data provider backends that you never ever need to download the whole satellite scenes. You're just downloading the final results of what you want to use. In addition, if all you want to do is visualize it, stars will look at the resolution of your graphics device and say, okay, you're asking in the same way that map, map view pushed back at me and say, you're giving me too many pixels to display. But stars won't say, you're giving me too many pixels to display. It'll say, your graphics device is only 600 by 400. So I'm going to rescale on the fly to 600 by 400. Even though the underlying data were 50,000 by 70,000. You can't see it, so you don't need it. And that's what's going on with stars at the moment. So that this proxy is true is not just, it's not just uh, doing it the way it was done 10 years ago in Rasta by moving around in chunks, but it's trying to think about which side of an API you need to do this on. Do you need to do it locally? Well, let's download all of the data, store it locally. Has anybody worked with satellite data when the data storage was on DVDs? The university geography department had uh, one of the largest DVD stands that I've ever seen. And if a, if a student put the DVD back in the wrong slot, their chances of surviving to the next morning were, were, were very poor if someone found them. Sometimes we thought that there were demons which came in that came in during the night and reordered the DVDs in the wrong slots. So you couldn't find the, the satellite scene you needed. The world isn't like that now. The world, most of the data providers, in particular the EU, or ESA and Sentinel, have very good APIs and so that over the last couple of years, from being almost impossible to work with the data volumes which were available, it's now becoming 
feasible to work with data volumes, but by pushing a good deal of the computation out to the back end so that you don't have to do it locally. There are, there are a number of different views to this because if the back end happens to be on a, a cloud that you have to pay for, then there's another balance which cuts in when your cloud bills become so large that it actually pays to have a large capacity server locally, which is the case for, for OpenGeoHub. So that OpenGeoHub have found that, they, that their, their cloud bills were getting so large that, that it was better simply to hose pipe uh, most of the data in locally and, and do it locally. But, but it's, 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 it's a hard call to, to make. So here we've got the pro proxy object. It looks very much the same, uh, the actual object, but it just, uh, it just says that, that it's a pro proxy object and this is the file that it's looking at. But there's nothing, the, the, the size of the object is actually very small. And we can carry out exactly the same uh, operation here. And it's still a proxy object. Is what we've done by defining this here. We haven't said we want to look at it. We haven't said we want to save it. This is still, if you like, in, in this case, both of the, the back end and the front end are on the same computer in the example. But the back end could be at the data provider rather than, uh, rather than, uh, rather than locally. We can also do things like splitting. So this is splitting up this, the, the separate bands and things like that. So the, on top of stars, uh, you'd then get, say, a project called like OpenEO. OpenEO is uh, also associated with, uh, with uh, ESA. And what this does is, is goes sort of more or less all of the way so that you, the, what you get on your client is only what you've asked for. You don't get anything more. Uh, in, in this case, uh, this is uh, making a connection to a database host. This is with a particular version of OpenEO and the underlying OpenEO library. And uh, I had to back off from the most recent version because they did, the demo didn't work for, uh, for um, and uh, OpenEO is, I believe, not on CRAN. It's, it's available on GitHub. So that what we might do in this case is, is to download a, a preview for an area of mountains in Switzerland, which is what, where they had their example, or in perhaps possibly in northern Italy. And this is, this is, then, uh, this is then the download of uh, what, we wanted to, what we wanted to get. And one of the things we've asked it to do on the back end is to generate the NDVI. So we've asked it to generate the NDVI on, on the back end. So what's coming down the tube is is a Ferdi is a is a is a is a is a pre pre processed geotiff with the NDVI, and it, it's all being computed on 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 the 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 other side. Now, yeah, okay. If this is something, and there are only a few of you who were involved in, in raster data closely. Um, then um, either, if, if what I'm about to say uh, is where you need to be going, then consider the Open Geo Hub uh, summer school next year in Wageningen. Uh, uh, Google Cubes, Google itself has now also implemented a multidimensional array abstraction. Partly because there are uh, Google's, uh, Google is, is open source, but 
some of the contributors are freelance software engineers and uh, they earn their living by having sponsors. These are companies or public bodies, grant giving organizations and others paying for their work to get things done. And the idea of multidimensional arrays has entered Google. So what you're then interested in doing is a cropping, reprojection, resampling uh, Earth observation data externally, creating your, your array somewhere before it even gets to stars. Uh, we could possibly, I could, I could try to pull up this one and see whether... So this this uh, this is Marius uh, Apple. Um, from from July, he gave a talk at this year's uh, Open GeoHub Summer School on on this, and the package itself is is moving forward, uh, I think, quite successfully. Uh, and what this is, the, this is, this is uh, trying to do is to address the way in which you can um, use the same proxy mechanism that STARS is already implementing, but take it to the next level. So that what you're using uh, Google Cubes to do is to create uh, uh, small sort of plug-in scripts which are ready to be sent out to the data providers so that you... Uh, minimize the amount of data traveling over the network and minimize the amount of local uh, compute. So the, it's, it's essentially a matter of resource balancing. So that if you're in a project with the data provider, then they're not going to worry too much about how much you use their servers. So that if you're in that kind of situation, you want their servers to do the computing rather than having to buy uh, a local server. And in those kinds of settings, the, then these the, 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 these kinds of things, the thing, things, uh, can 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 work uh, successfully. There's still a good deal of of um, action on this. There are there are a number of other alternatives for looking at. There's one called SciDB, one called Rasterman. Um, for handling uh, large scientific arrays. Uh, where you only need to work and possibly in uh, um, resampled resolution in relation to the data sources. As at the moment, the satellites from... I'm sure you, you've seen the, uh, the uh, uh, conflicts between uh, the Brazilian president and the space agency in Brazil, where he's claiming that their satellite images of... Uh, of destruction in the Amazon are made up and fake news. And uh, I, I, I've been sort of involved in bits of this for some time and went, went to Brazil in 2002 after the meeting in Santa Barbara, was invited to the lab there. And we were talking about data representation, how you represent data and so on. And, and their data representation skills are supreme that they know how to get it done uh, so that you, you so that by 2011 Gilberto Camara gave a keynote at the first spatial statistics conference and he said that at that stage they could go from satellite imagery appearing deltas being taken so you're looking at changes from the last time it's about 8 days uh, you could have if if the area was less than a certain number of hectares you'd send in a, a police jeep. Uh, if it was over a certain number of hectares, you go for a Chinook with 80 Marines. And, and if you look at the, the, the Brazilian uh, deforestation figures from the time they started using satellite data for this, it was very impressive. Unfortunately, uh, subsequent governments have not been as uh, focused which is a great shame because, because uh, in terms of, of uh, global impact, what the people in, in uh, uh, San Jose dos Campos were doing was, was really very good. It's excellent work because it is that they were focusing on the science and delivering. 
uh, one of the other things which shocked them, which probably should worry us, is the very rapid conversion of uh, the um, province of Sao Paulo uh, from food production to biofuels. So it's mostly sugarcane. And again, you could pick up, but that takes longer, but you, you had to ask the right questions of the, of the images. And the, 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 the satellites they're running are CBERS, which are China, Brazil, uh, Earth observation satellites. So they were working with the Chinese. The Chinese were, had provided the launch capacity, but quite a lot of the instruments were built in, in, in Brazil. Uh, and th th those are the kinds of data sources of which we now have large numbers uh, whenever things happen like fires in Australia, then, then very often in news reports you're seeing ASAP as uh, the Sentinel. Uh, Sentinel has, the, there are, uh, there's a family of Sentinel, Sentinel satellites, some of which are the ones which are providing uh, air pollution data. It's a more or less, it's a near real time air pollution data, but observed from space. Uh, which, of course, for politicians is 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 difficult because they say, well, well, we've we we we've brought down the use of cars a lot now, and people aren't driving to work as much as they were. But if the satellite says that the NOx was this, then it was this. So there's no way you get round that. You could you could look at the calibration parameters, but you can't really get away from the fact that there's still a uh, an, an over concentration of NOx in a particular in a particular valley. So. Uh, Google cubes is certainly one of the things to, to have in the back of your heads that, that it, those kinds of approaches, the stars proxy, uh, uh, open EO, uh, Google cubes are ways of getting access to, even for, for master's students, you can get access to uh, fruitful satellite imagery it's going to let you look at hypotheses which previously would have been difficult to address with that resolution without necessarily having to have lots of, lots of local hardware or lots of local storage capacity. So the, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a back story there. Um, so I now need to find the, this one. So we're now moving on to the, the, the second portion of today's talk, which is, uh, is much shorter, so that now you've got the, the big picture. When we close the transmission at 3 o'clock, um, uh, then I can sort of inquire, find out whether the points about the difference between SP and Rasta as against SF and STARS are a bit clearer. I hope they are. I'm not saying that SP and Rasta for Rasta data are uh, end of life, no. But when they meet contemporary data sources, then they were written for data in not necessarily small, but not as big as we see now, with, certainly with Earth observation data, when it's, it's coming in on a weekly basis or it's coming in several times a month. Uh, yes? Uh, do you know, if, uh, yes, of course you know. <laughs> For example, one of the like, biggest problems in Rasta is like run out, run out of memory. Like when you, you have like a dirty huge raster, yes. it runs out of memory. Yes. So the question was that, that with, when you're using raster, then you can run out of memory. Yeah. And uh, can stars solve that? Yeah. It, it won't solve it automatically. Okay. So the, the, you, st you still need to consider and think uh, what's going on. So the idea is that the back end, the proxy back end, should be able to work out how much it can bring into memory and how much it can't. But there are some operations which STARS has not yet addressed, which are in raster, particularly the focal operations, and some other typical GIS operations where you, you can't just divide things up into chunks because you need to look across the boundary of a chunk. And if you need to look across the boundary of a chunk, 
then I, I haven't tried it with, with SARS, so I don't know what, what is going to happen if you're trying to do a focal operation. Uh, I do know that uh, uh, in a situation like that, then I would, uh, I know grass best, so I'd use grass. Uh, others would be able to use grass or saga through uh, QGIS. Uh, saga by itself would do the same kind of thing, simply because a GIS, especially a GIS with a focus on raster, would know how to uh, organize the, the, the data stream. So that grass, for instance, historically from the very beginning when computers had as much as 64K, so 64K is relatively a small amount of RAM, where you needed the operating system and, and the programs in as well as the data, uh, uh, it reads a row or part of a row of a raster at a time and then stores uh, intermediate products. So that grass was, was always written to operate in that kind of way. What it does typically now, it may be that it will read 100 rows across the top of a, a 30 or 60,000 uh, cell wide raster, and, and, but it will then iterate down using pointers so that the, 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 the top row disappears and the bottom row is in the top row, but it's using a pointer so that it knows that that's the one south of the one before. So, so that uh, Saga and Grass both know how to do these kinds of things and other raster systems would also know how to do it. So that I typically um, bail out before I hit the warning. So I, I don't try to make raster or R do everything simply because there are things that other software does better. And in, in this case, then Saga uh, is very good at that kind of thing. Grass is, is very good at that kind of thing. And they do it with fairly minimal machine resources. Uh, it is possible to use fairly large clusters for doing some of these things, but it's very difficult to use clusters, particularly for focal operations, because a, a cluster works nicely if, you're, if you've got a chunk which doesn't talk to another chunk. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. So any, any other questions around that? Uh, there are different data providers, and uh, in uh, if I remember correctly, then you need a sort of a protocol file or a, to set it up to say how to get to a particular data data provider. Some of them are there, some of them are not. Uh, in most of in the case of the question was 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 was, was about accessing uh, backends of uh, of uh, uh, EO data providers. Um, It can get messy if you have to write your own protocol for getting hold of the data. Most of the common ones are available, but a general comment would be that uh, most of the packages are hosted on uh, previously all of the packages which we were involved with were hosted on RForge. Now some of them are on still on RForge, so that our Google and our Geos are still on RForge, and others are on GitHub. So that the typical question would be, say, say that this was for a, for a question for a package uh, which has uh, which, which is written using GitHub would be to would be to create a, a reproducible example with the problem, a small, a small, small, very small, <laughs> so no big data, but but illustrating what the problem is, uh, and post an issue on the GitHub site or look for a previous issue that someone else has asked a similar question. So it could be that something is waiting to be implemented and hasn't been implemented. And, and it may be something where the users themselves who have insight into the, uh, into the underlying problems of the data source can make a contribution. Uh, so that being active with regard to GitHub issues is, uh, is uh, certainly a constructive way of displaying a, a, a concern for resolving an issue. It doesn't mean that uh, the person raising the issue knows how to solve the problem or would ever be able to know how to solve it, but at least it draws it to the attention of the, uh, of the, uh, of the package maintainer. So that, that I think, that would be my, my approach. So that if, if I was faced with a, with a data source which wasn't 
available out of uh, out of the box would be to, to contact the maintainers. Now, I have a particular uh, advantage in that case is that I think the maintainers, if they see an issue coming from me, then they tend to look at it. Not always, but but sometimes, most of the time, probably. Uh, if it's coming from outside, it needs to be motivated uh, by a a good use case so that the maintainer looking at, at the issue which has been raised can see it and say, yeah, I can see why this researcher needs this question answered and I can see why he's asking me. Um, the answer might be, uh, I'll be speaking at the Open Geo Pub Summer School. If, if, you, if you're there, raise the question with me there. But it, it needs quite a lot of, 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 um, of uh, um, willingness to be active and to understand that the maintainers may have other uh, pressing concerns at the moment. They may not be able to get to that problem. But they may have met somebody else who had the same, the same problem, act, accessing a particular source of, source of data. And this would also apply to historical satellite data. So it is not everything which is available because the ones which are sort of work out of the box are the ones which are current now, which people are looking at now, and ones that people were looking at before may not be available out of the box. Okay, so now I want to talk a bit about uh, support and uh, topological operations, but I won't talk about them for very long, and then I'll go on to input-output. Uh, support is important because it expresses the relationship between the way you're observing things and the underlying data generation processes. Now, I've got some examples in this in this uh, in this script, which we won't go through, uh, but which we may need later on. So that, that don't 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 forget about them. So that what we're dealing with to quite a large extent when we're thinking about support is that the data that we have to hand is not a, not necessarily the data we would have collected if we were present ourselves. It could be that the data that are to hand are not well matched. They don't have the same footprint. Uh, a classic example was uh, work done through uh, the Marine Research Institute where the, where the oceanographers and the fisheries biologists sailed on separate cruises so that they collected data about the water at certain points in time and collected data about the contents of fish stomachs at other points in time space and time, and they then tried to match them. They then said, it's a GIS problem or it's a spatial statistics problem. And we said, no, it's a data collection problem. You should have measured the water quality at the same points at which you made the trawls. If you'd done that, then they would be at more or less the same point at more or less the same time. The idea at that stage was to look for, uh, for, for ocean surface color to see whether it implied the algae density, which would have uh, led one to expect there to be more marine activity in that place. But, but if the sea color was measured two weeks later, 60 sea miles away, I'm, a bit of a waste of time. But the, but the, the two different uh, scientific disciplines preferred to use different boats at different times. And they had a budget for two cruises, not one. So, so. Uh, there's a nice uh, comment by statisticians in similar, com uh, similar s situations is that if people are going to do things like that, then uh, then uh, you, the advice you give is that the next pro next project you organise, have a statistician be one of the uh, one of the planners, because then you avoid unnecessary variability. Because in that case, what you had to do was to interpolate in space and time the uh, 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 oceanographic characteristics to the points at which the the fish were caught. And there was a big error band in all directions around any of those values. So, so it was very difficult to draw any conclusions. 
But if they'd been observed at the same place and time, then, then the, the footprints would match. And if the footprints don't match, then you have a problem. Sometimes the footprints are very difficult to observe because the data you have, particularly in economics and the social sciences, are bounded by administrative units. And they're not relevant. As if you're looking at a labor market, then a labor market and administrative units very often won't be relevant. And that the actual behavior of economic agents is driven, the micro level behavior, is driven by something different than uh, than the units that you're using, so that the units are actually introducing more noise than light. So what we actually need to get at the problems we're interested in are good handles on the underlying realities, and very often the data we have don't give us good handles on the underlying realities. Uh, this just got worse because we got, we got uh, um, self-reported data, and quite a lot of self-reported data involves uh, unavoidable uh, unobservable, self, uh, unobservable selection bias. So we don't know from self-reported data, and this is then your... So you, you could probably take over now and talk for half an hour about selection bias. And so why you can't always trust the data which seems to be being, being made available. But, but we, we, we can get back to that. But the, the, it, it, we appear to have lots of data, but the amount of data... So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an English uh, romantic poem uh, of, a, of, a, of a mariner uh, abandoned on the sea and floating around and looking at the sea and saying, uh, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Of course, it was the sea, so it was salty water. But, but if you look at big data, sometimes I get the same feelings. So, so it would be really nice to have done a, a small sort of ground-truthing uh, survey where I was controlling the stratification and 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 support has quite a lot about this to do how are we thinking about the 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 conceptual uh, constructs that we're using and how far how, how far do the data we're using actually match those and quite often they don't sometimes there are good reasons why you have to make inferences without data that matches well, and these are quite often seen in spatial epidemiology. In spatial epidemiology, you very often have, have data, uh, say, for hospital admissions. Um, some interesting work has been done, for instance, in the States about hospital admissions for uh, respiratory tract cancer in Florida. Now, you think Florida is the place people go to retire. It's got such nice climate, apart from the hurricanes, but nice climate. But what you need to get back to is the migration history of those uh, patients, because maybe they grew up in the Midwest, in the industrial belt. So, the, so you've got someone who was living next to a steel mill in Illinois or in Michigan, who's retired to Florida and is then... The, the, so you get an, uh, an over-occurrence of types of cancer which shouldn't be associated with the environmental drivers where the person now is. And it's quite difficult to handle because very often you don't have that data on the patient. You don't know where the patient has lived during their childhood. You don't know where they were living when they were adults. All you know is where they live now. And you know what the what the diagnosis is, or, or possibly the cause of death, but you don't know what has been affecting them b before that. So the, the, there's there's quite a lot of noise caused by people moving around, but there's also uh, difficulty caused by the need to draw conclusions, particularly in in uh, in um, surveillance epidemiology, without full data, so that you. You know it may be something to do with where they live, but you, you, you don't have any variables collected at the same time about where they live. So you can, you can, you, you, you would then typically you say a, a spatially structured random effect to say, we know it's something about where they live, but we don't know what it is. So we'll we, we say it's something to do with where they live, but we don't know what it is. Um, so that there's a good deal of work, say, by, by uh, Wakefield and Lyons, which is a, is a nice article in a, in a stati spatial statistics handbook. Uh, 
uh, the key article on which is is poorly cited because it was so difficult, uh, Gotway and Young 2002, uh, is about change of support. So that say that we need to infer the uh, environmental load on an asthma patient or a group of asthma patients. So you take the, uh, the monitoring stations for air pollution in a city and you interpolate to their places of residence or places of work and try and work out what the load on the patients is. But there's a lot of in interpolation error involved there. You, you, you just don't have the measurements of the air going into those people's lungs. Nowadays, the, there are, there are, you can use a, a Raspberry Pi or something. You can, you can also measure indoor pollution. But it's, it, much of it is still very, very patchy. And the support that you're not observing the same thing so you're looking at an outcome, but you can't get hold of the drivers, or the, the, the covariates, with the same uh, spatial support, or spatial and temporal support. Uh, so Gottway and Young, they propose some, some uh, remediary steps, but they all take you a long way out into Bayesian inference. Because you're having to carry through the error involved in interpolation at each step. Uh, it doesn't mean that the result you get is useless. It just means that it involves much more fairly heavy statistics to get there. And one of the steps uh, which is involved is uh, Trondium, NTNU, uh, which is INLA, uh, uh, which is uh, Integrated Nested Laplace Approximations, which is a way of doing Bayesian inference without uh, doing lots of, of, of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, simulations or similar Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uh, si simulations. So that being able to do simulations or being able to get to Bayesian inference quickly, it is happening, but it's taking a long, 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 long time. And INLA is one of the tools which is feasible within this, or putting INLA within other, uh, um, other technologies uh, where INLA can't do everything itself. Uh, so that y using INLA within uh, within uh, uh, MCMC is also a, a possible technique. So that the in interior model is an INLA model, which is giving uh, marginal distributions on, on the posteriors, uh, and then it's put into an MCMC above that. And these are the kinds of things that, that uh, Vig Vigilio Gomez Rubio has been, been, been working on. Because then you can, you can model the uncertainty associated with the difference in support of the covariates that you're using, so that you can carry through that uncertainty in 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 reaching reaching a conclusion. But it is it is tricky. Uh, one of the other things is concerned more with uh, with um, uh, geoinformatics. Uh, that's the field that that uh, Ed Sepepsma. <coughs> Uh, concentrates on mostly uh, he's professor of geoinformatics in Munster and one of the things which he's been concerned about over a longer period is and the, these are the references here which are worth looking at uh, is are the analyses we do meaningful uh, are the ways in which we're treating the data meaningful uh, this is in the sense that is uh, do you consider a value to be constant, say, over a segment of time? Or should it actually be trending? Or, uh, how do you view this? And this is something which has, which has, been, uh, which has been added into uh, the SF package uh, through the um, uh, aggregate uh, sorry, agr attribute. So we've got here, these are the attributes of an SF object. It's got names, row names, which is the SF column, this, which, which is the one with the geometry in. It's got its class, but it's also got an agr. And the idea then is, say that you're overlaying one set of geometries and another set of geometries, you want to know whether you can copy across the value because it's constant across that. Or whether perhaps you shouldn't. Perhaps what you're doing is, is that you're so say that you've got uh, a set of local authorities and you've got a number of points and you're dropping the points down on the local authorities and you want to sum sample the number of inhabitants. Now, at that point, 
with the support of the point, the number of inhabitants is not the same as the sum of inhabitants of the municipality. But if you just read it off, then it will appear to be the same. So if you drop the points down, then you get an SF object coming out, which has point geometry, and then it's got population. So how many people live at that point? Oh, it's the same as the number who, as were in the municipality. And so you've got three points which all fall in the same municipality and you make the sum of those because they're all in the same municipality. It's nonsense. It's not meaningful. And these are some of the things which they're trying. It isn't, it isn't all in place yet. It's the same with support for units. It's not in place yet. But we're getting there. So we're trying to provide warnings or indications when, after having carried out a, a, a topological uh, operation and created a new uh, SF object data frame with the data, some of the variables which, are, which were present in the object you were querying shouldn't really be used for the support you now have. Because the number of population, the count of population at that point is not the same as the count for the, for the municipality. So it's trying to think clearly about how to represent the data associated with each of the points. But we're not quite there yet. So that typically the, the aggr or whether it's aggregated or constant or identity are not filled in. And if you want to fill them in, you can fill them in. So we could say that we are associating length. The length here is going to be in meters to each of the segments of the, of the light rail. So here we've got them as, as meters. And we're not, we're not really there yet, but we're starting to get there, to think clearly about how to represent support. But support is, is I think, got Wayne Young, 2002. Now we're in 2019, that's 17 years. And we've made a little progress, but very little. And the same kinds of things with this as a meaningful, which kinds of meaningful operations can you do on attributes after a, a geometric or a topological operation? And we're not, re we're not really there because people, sorry, um, everybody, I should say everybody, because it includes us. We, we fall into exactly the same traps because our, and indeed, all programming languages of the same kind treat data as data is just data. But quite a lot of this data isn't just data. It applies to a particular context. That if you've got the count of population, it's for a given uh, point in time. So that in a municipality, say in Norway, it will be the readout from the population register at a given uh, point in time. It will be usually it's midnight on the 31st of December. So it, that's all of the registration data which has been processed by New Year's Eve. Right? So that, that's, that's the count. But if you divide up that area, just divide it up, then the count won't be the same. If you drop point, points on it, they won't have that count. So, so anyway, uh, there's, there's a nice discussion also in in this paper by uh, Daw, uh, Tom, Thomas Agnon and Van Hems uh, in 2015 uh, of the similar kinds of things. And this is, this is this is a useful paper. So I'll jump over the Boston housing uh, data set and we'll be coming back to that uh, most likely later on. Uh, I'll give you a brief um, example of topology operations just just to, to touch on it but we'll be getting back to the same data set tomorrow morning uh, this is the broad street cholera data set um, we used it in both editions of the book uh, so you'll be aware that john snow uh, is reputed by uh, esri who's the manufacturer of uh, arcgis to have first drawn a map and then concluded that the place with the 
largest number of cases of cholera must be where the problem is and went and disabled the water pump. He didn't do that. He knew in advance that uh, although uh, medicine or the medical establishment believed in 1854 that cholera was spread through the air, he believed that it was spread through polluted water, so water which had been mixed with sewage. So he had a working hypothesis from previous cases that he'd been involved with when he'd fought with the medical establishment. And what he said was that the... Uh, the um, this, this is a close-up of the map. So this is where the pump was. So what he actually said was that I need to disable the pump because I know that there must be something wrong with the lining of the, the pump shaft. So that sewage is leaking into the pump shaft so that when people are pumping out water, which they're drinking uncooked, this is, this is how, how the disease is being spread. Uh, he also uh, hazarded a, a guess that the reason that, uh, that um, workers at the brewery and their families did not get cholera was because they were given a large can of beer to take home every night and their family, from the smallest children, they all drank the beer. It was weak beer, but they drank the beer. So beer had been boiled, it was from a different well. So they didn't get cholera. They could be unlucky and get involved in being too close to somebody who had. But it was quite obvious to Snow that it wasn't transmission through the air. It was a particular uh, point source uh, problem. So uh, the idea is to find uh, uh, the distance to the Broad Street pump and find out what the proportion of cases close to the Broad Street pump or not might be. And then the, this is an example, which I, I won't go through the example now because, because we can get back to it later, for uh, establishing what's going on with the, with the Broad Street. So the, the, there's quite a lot in, 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 in the books about this, that what we're doing is, is uh, uh, buffering out the housing, the, the streets. So we have the, the buildings, we want the, the buildings to be smaller, we want to take the roads, make them a bit broader, and then found the cost distance from each of the pumps to each of the houses in which uh, mortalities occurred, and then to to, to see what the proportion was between uh, between uh, those where uh, the Broad Street pump was nearer was false and the Broad Street pump was nearer was was true um, on the on the basis that that people would tend to collect water from the nearest pump some of the ones for whom the Broad Street pump was further away would still collect water from that pump but there's no data on on that um, I'll also jump over this bit because it's a bit scary and concerns an update to GEOS 372 and an explanation of why that happened. So in the last uh, six, seven minutes of the, of the streaming, uh, then I'll just mention a little bit about uh, input-output because it's, it, it's, it's not so difficult, it's fairly simple. Uh, uh, SF underscore X soft version shows the version of external software used by the version I'm running. So I'm running uh, GEOS uh, 380, Google 302, uh, Proj uh, 641. Uh, my Google was built with GEOS and I'm using Proj H, which I'll explain tomorrow morning. Now, what's going on here is that SF and you could also drop in our Google which uses these two, and GEOS, which uses this one, depend crucially on external software, so that this XSoft version is the version of external software. This is Google. It provides uh, input-output of files, web services, databases, and it also provides reprojection. Proj provides reprojection and data transformation. And GEOS provides 2D uh, uh, topological predicates and operations. This one provides extra help for making geometries valid. And this one provides units of measurement. Uh, SP didn't handle these directly itself. 
but used Argios and Argudel. SF contains the external dependencies itself, so that it, it, it contains everything. And that's why stars connects to SF and SF connects to Google, so that the raster input output is done is done is done that way. Some of the packages Google cubes uh, connect directly to Google themselves that so they need to be built against uh, against Google itself. So let's say we, we ask uh, what the vector drivers are. We can ask ST drivers and sort them and then these are the these are the the, the names of the drivers. There are altogether 80, 1, 2, 3, 4. So 84 vector drivers. Some of them are archaic. Uh, others of them are little used. So maybe a company wanted a driver implemented and paid for it to be implemented. Some of them are interesting, like the virtual drivers. Those are vector drivers. Raster drivers. There are, there are even more raster drivers. So you can see here, there are, I've got 140. I have probably somewhat a somewhat larger set of vector drivers and raster drivers than one might have with the Windows or uh, or Mac OS uh, CRAN binary installs, which those of you who have uh, SF installed would probably have have the 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 the, the, the CRAN binaries. Is there anybody who's not using OS X or Windows? No Linux, oh. Uh, and uh, OS X is a bit more of a struggle than Windows. Win Windows, we have a, a little bit better control of than, than OS X because OS X keeps moving. In particular, the, the level of certification which Apple now requires is, is tiresome. So, uh, it's a mis misspelled S3 shape file. There are, there are, issues to do with how you do input-output, mostly concerned with the, with the particular data formats. Uh, up until very recently, the most common vector format was the S3 shapefile. Even S3 itself has been trying to get people to use the international standard geo package for years with little success. One of the reasons why the shapefile is a problem is because it uses a variant DBF file for st storing the attributes, and a DBF file is a text file with a binary header. So the geometry is okay, but the DBF file is a problem and has a strict limit on the length of the names of the fields, which is a problem. And it has problems with the encoding of... Uh, of uh, letters outside ASCII. Sometimes it can manage to get to code page 1252. Sometimes you, you're on code page 1252, but it thinks it's on a different code page. And if you go over to GeoPackage, then you're on UTF-8 and you're quite okay. UTF-8 mean anything to anybody? Would you like to... D does anybody here use UTF-8? Does anybody have a cell phone? Sorry, a smart smartphone. If you use a smartphone, you use UTF-8. Uh, the, the, these wouldn't work without uh, SQLite and STF-8, uh, so, so UTF-8 and, and things like that. They, they, it just wouldn't work. So what's a geopackage? A geopackage is a file database using SQLite, um, help, most usefully a modern version of SQLite, better than 3.11, or 3.11 or better. And it, it, it simply contains a set of tables inside which contain usually lots of stuff that you didn't know that you had. So it's a bit bigger, maybe, than some of the representations of vector data. But it's, 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 it's the only go-to vector representation that should be used. If you want to go further than that and interface with the database is directly fine, but if you're going to use a file, use a, a, a geo package. The, uh, the data are recorded, uh, the data are recorded uh, binary, so numerical data are recorded binary, so that there's no loss of precision. If you use GeoJSON or GML, which was the, GML was the international standard for quite a long time, it's text-based. 
It's a it's a it's an XML based language. Do any of you ever use any XML? Anybody write use Word? Yeah. Does anybody use Word? Use XML? Yes. Word Word documents or XML documents. So docx, xlsx, it's because they're zipped archives of XML documents, which are text documents. There are, there are some other bits and pieces there. But anyway, so let's, ha let's have a look inside a, a geo package. This is the geo package of the, of the Broad Street pump. It's got one point. Now, if I ask what, how many tables there are there, then you can see it's got quite a lot of different tables here. One of them contains the ge geometry columns. So this is the geo package contents, the geo package geometry columns. It's got the OGR comma. It's got, we've got 13 different tables in this database for one, one point. <laughs> and this is, this, if we look at the geometry columns, this is one observation of six variables. This is the column name. as a table name, column name, the geometry type name, uh, the, uh, the uh, um, coordinate reference system ID, and whether it has a Z and whether it has an M. Isn't that nice? So it's, it's got lots of stuff in it. So, so that uh, you, you could think that this, is, this, is, this must be more complicated than a shapefile, and it is, but it needs to be. And among the things which are quite nice is that it's got an, an R tree built in and things like, so that it can, the, yeah, geo package is where, where you go. So if we just want to get the geometry out of it, then we can see the, uh, the beginning here of, of a raw vector. So if we're just looking at this, this is a raw vector representing the 29. Um, 29 bytes. 29 bytes. Uh, if we then start trying to use this, we could ask how many layers there are on, in it. We're looking at the, the, the layers which, which are coming back from this. Uh, this is then on the SF side, and you can see that the description here is very much like what's inside the geo package. But it's because the geo package has been converted into simple features, and this is then the view of the, the, the simple features, the view of the uh, of the layers in this in this uh, in this uh, geo package, if we just get the output from it, uh, we've got. Um, sorry, sorry. This was uh, this was the B pump, and this is the NB pump. This is the ones the eleven pumps which were not uh, the Broad Street pump. There are twelve pumps in in the data set. One is the Broad Street pump, the others are the, 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 the other ones. And there we are. So we can find out that there's a layer there. If we want to look at the information in the SP, on the SP side, we'd use R, R Goodle and OGR Info to tell us information about it. And there are some warnings there which we can, we can ignore telling us where, what, what, what's inside it. Once again, we've got 11 rows and things like that. So we can, we can look at the, the, uh, the data. If we look at uh, Google info of the preview file from uh, OpenEO, it's a GeoTIFF uh, so by uh, this driver. Statistics are not supported by the driver. That means that, that when it's looking to see what the potential values of the, uh, of the NDVI uh, that there's no header in the file telling it what those are. It would have to look at the data to see what the, what the, the minimum, maximum, mean, and standard deviation were. Uh, we can open it. This is uh, a, a Google, uh, uh, Google Open. To open it, we can ask what the dimension of the GeoTIFF file is. We can find its, the, the name. We could get the data without converting it into a spatial object. So here we're using internal functions within our Google to get the data. These are very similar to the same things in STARS. So just grabbing the data. And we close, close the connection to that file. So that would be the way we would go if we were trying to get bits of the file, which you, you, you wouldn't need to do. In summary for input output, then SF functions, stread and 
our Google read OGR are equivalent to the same kinds of things. S SF package ST write and our Google write OGR do similar kinds of things. When uh, when you're writing using either our Google or SF, if you try to overwrite a file which already exists, then the system was most likely to say that I don't want to do that. You have to tell me that I'm, I'm to delete the existing file. I'm not going to do this. So that, that, that when I write scripts, then I tend to include uh, either overwrite is true or uh, delete DSN is true or whatever, so that, so that I can rerun the script without, uh, without running into problems. Uh, the representation in raster for, for input input output um, is very similar to uh, read uh, read underscore stars give it the name of the file off you go and the, this this would then be the the way that the raster raster representation came in for 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 for, for this for this data set for output uh, our google write google Stars write stars, or raster write raster, all do very similar, similar kinds of things. The last note is that of a reminder, if I survive long enough to give the course again, then we need to get back to tiled representations, because we're not there yet. As the idea is that if you have a raster which is in very fine resolution, obviously you can't see all of it. So you need to have... Uh, a tile or a pyramid of tiles so that uh, you recall um, when I was importing data from uh, uh, Elev, Elevr from uh, the AWS, so elevation data, then I gave it a zoom level. And the zoom level 14 or 16 is very, very, very high resolution. And then you step in. They don't necessarily go that, that one pixel at the zoom level above, the zoom level below is four pixels of the one before, but it's something like that. So that you're, you're aggregating the pixels so that, that when you get to zoom level one, you can display a picture of the whole world without a problem. But if you're at zoom, zoom level 16, then you will be downloading the data until your, your SSD fills up. It will take forever. So the the, the, the so the, that's the, the the idea with tiled representations is that you only use the amount of resolution you need. Now raster pyramids, so building a pyramid inside a geotef is something which is known about, but which we haven't dealt with. Tiled vector representations are used by uh, OpenStreetMap and. Uh, and uh, uh, Google Maps and presumably Apple and here and, and all of these people because they know that if they're trying to deliver a, a roadmap to somebody quickly, then the, that person doesn't need all of the details in the roadmap. They need only the ones they can see at that resolution and also with some generalizations so that they don't want to see all of the curves on a road, that would just be a road. Uh, and we haven't got that. Uh, we probably need to go there so that tiled representations are something which the, the grandchildren of, of the young guys now can, can, can deal with. So in about 50 years, we should, we should be there. But it will, it will still take a considerable amount of effort to get the representations um, to a level of functionality, which means that uh, applied researchers can do their work without having problems pushed on them. At the moment, we're in a situation where there are quite a lot of difficulties between the... Or, there's also a, a lot of work being done on smoothing out the difficulties, for instance, the one raised in, in the question, that, that we, we don't have protocols for accessing particular data sources. Uh, another problem is that the data providers change their protocols from time to time, which we all face, and, and, and very often downstream you don't know that they've been changed. Another problem, which is more in terms of research reproducibility, is that when you're downloading from from a um, uh, from from a cloud source, 
then we don't know when they have actually updated data. We don't necessarily know. It may be that they record it in the data source that a particular uh, um, uh, field or feature was updated, but we don't know. And those are the kinds of things for reproducible research it would be really useful to know. Otherwise, you actually do need to have a local resource for sort of um, snapshotting uh, the actual data you were using when you used it, despite the fact that it may be remote. And that, we, again, we were not sure how that should be handled. Because if it's too large for you to, to keep locally, so say that you're asking a remote server to generate you an NDVI, and you're still asking for the same date and the same locations when you rerun the script three months later, but maybe something's changed on the server. Do you know? How would we know how to find out? So maybe you could, you could make some kind of digested summary of the data as it appears. And then you'd say, okay, something's changed. But you still wouldn't know what it was that had changed. Something had changed. So maybe they found out, as I, I, I get the bulletins from, from the uh, uh, ice, uh, uh, ice imagery um, service which was previously run by the Norwegian Metro uh, Meteorological Office. And quite often they'll say, okay, so if somebody downloaded our stuff from yesterday, uh, there, was a, there, was a, there was a small outage. <laughs> sometimes it's the whole image is gone, but sometimes it's that the, there was a calibration problem on part of the image. And so now if you follow the bulletins which are on email messages, regularly, then you can probably work out what you need to do. But if you're revisiting a data source months later, then will you know that the data you downloaded the first time were actually the ones with the problem? And that's something we, we don't know how to do. If you had your DVDs and the students hadn't shuffled them, then you could go back to the same DVD and it was always the same data until the, until the, uh, the molecules uh, reorganized themselves. With when you're bringing in data from from the cloud, you don't you don't really know. So, uh, leaving those who may be on the stream with that joyful thought, we move on to tomorrow when it will be even worse. <laughs>